Thank you, Matt. So here you have uh, a Canadian perspective of what is going on in the United States right now. Uh, so I guess the first question that uh, everyone has is why the people of the United States actually elected Donald Trump. In some post-election analysis, the feeling is that it was the deteriorating economic conditions that provided the way for Trump to rise to the top, especially in, in some former very stronghold union states. Uh, if we look at Pennsylvania, we look at Michigan, Wisconsin, and Ohio. All of those states have been hit hard in recent years. We've seen plant closures, we've seen massive layoffs, uh, jobs shipped overseas, bad trade deals, all of these things that allowed the U.S. market to be flooded with foreign products, uh, especially when it came to steel and aluminum and manufactured products. And workers saw that even the unions were not able to do much to stop the bleeding in their plants, nor to stop the bleeding of their jobs. So even many union members, I have to say, look to Trump as being the person, to being their savior, really. After all, they saw him as being a great businessman. He was not a politician, and he was not afraid to take on the powers in Washington, D.C., or across the globe. If you were listening to some of his comments, at one point he even committed that he was going to drain the swamp in Washington. Now, if you heard some of Trump's campaign promises, I'm sure you also recognized that he actually stole the message of the trade unions in the United States. When he talked about trade, he talked about jobs, he talked about the economy, and he talked about bad trade deals. And because he was perceived as a great businessman, not as a politician, he was not someone they thought would be intimidated by DC politicians, they saw him as being his own man. He was able to persuade the workers and even the states that were strong union supporters to give him a chance to fix all of their problems. And the results show that many union members, they bought into his rhetoric and they supported him. All you have to do today is turn on the news, open a newspaper to see the daily scandal, learn about Trump's Twitter troubles, or read about attacks on issues that are near and dear to the hearts of trade unions, to their members and all working families. As if employment and labor laws were not bad enough in the United States for unions and for workers, we now brace ourselves for a radical right shift on employment and labor law protections. We have already seen an attack on workers' pay where, as an example, we will be returning to an antiquated, narrow application of who even gets overtime pay. At the National Labor Relations Board, which enforces labor law, we will have a majority of Republican right-wing members, and we can expect to see rules and decisions that will certainly not be in the favor of workers. We are already seeing a weakening of our health and safety standards. Changes to the healthcare system that could leave millions without coverage and threaten the lives of our most vulnerable, including many of our steelworker families. We also know that the person he has chosen to fill the vacant seat in the Supreme Court is known as a right wing, a far right winger. More bad news for unions as there is a case before the court right now that public sector union members have a constitutional right to decline dues payments unless they consent to do so. So dues payers will be deemed to opt out of dues unless they actually opt in. And just as the Republicans will have a majority at the board, they will also have the numbers in the Supreme Court in order to get that passed. We're seeing the harsh enforcement of immigration laws, and I'm sure you've all seen on the news uh, the, uh, the ban on Muslims and what chaos that has created. And the most lethal blow against unions, along with the Labor Board and the Supreme Court hostility, would be the expansion of right-to-work laws, both nationally and in many of the states. And during the first week of his presidency, an, a national right-to-work bill was introduced in the U.S. Congress. Now, currently, we have 28 states who are already right-to-work. And right-to-work sounds really nice, 
but right to work is anything but right to work. We actually say right to work for less. So when we talk about right to work, what it really means is that a union must legally represent a worker and a worker legally does not have to pay a penny for that representation. It is simply a way to crush unions. Now Trump says that he likes right to work because workers are not forced to pay big fees to the unions. He also says he likes it because it gives greater flexibilities to the companies. We don't have to look far to see what impact right to work can have on unions if he passes a national right to work law and if other states go right to work. With Trump in power in Washington and the Republican Party dominant right across the country now, the results could be devastating for labor. Today in the US, only 11% of American workers belong to unions. In the private sector, that number is just slightly over 6%. And as you can imagine, as union density has declined, wealth inequality has continued to rise. And billions of dollars continue to be spent on crushing workers' attempts to form unions. Anti-union campaigns are on the rise. And some of you may know of some of the anti-union campaigns that we have going on right now in the United States. We have Nissan, Volkswagen, Boeing, Airbus, just to name a few, where employer campaigns that violate labor laws and ignore the wishes of workers. In healthcare, we are already seeing the start of the repeal and the replace of the Affordable Care Act better known as Obamacare. For over 22 million Americans who now have coverage under Obamacare, that could mean the difference in life and death. For women, going back to higher insurance premiums. If you didn't know, under the old system before Obamacare, women had to pay 140% higher for insurance premiums than men. It could mean taking away any, any uh, extra for maternity leave. You'd have to pay extra to actually have maternity leave. And where a pregnancy could possibly be regarded as a pre-existing condition, which probably means that you're not even insurable in many, many cases. The attack on many of our social programs, if you look at Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, chances are for people who depend on those programs, they're going to see changes in the coming four years, and they're not going to be good changes. Privatization, lowering of benefits, increasing age for Social Security. All of these changes would have a dramatic impact on the lives of individuals who depend on these programs for their health and for their livelihood. In Washington, we are now faced with a Congress that is owned and paid for by the radical right. Trump did not keep his promise about draining the swamp in DC. Well, he did drain it, but then he refilled it. He refilled the swamp with his own critters. We are seeing cuts to budgets for agencies that protect workers' rights, that protect the environment, and that protect the rights of women and children. Now, during his campaign, Mr. Trump also promised that he was going to overhaul the tax system. Well, looks like he's going to keep that promise as well. However, the cuts that he has in mind would see corporations pay less taxes and everyone in the lower classes would pay more taxes. Trump has also brought with him the politics of division. His election has come with some really, really ugly consequences. We're seeing division, we're seeing hate, and we're seeing inequality. Many of these things that are being exposed and allowed to be exposed under his leadership. So again, sisters and brothers, we have to ask ourselves, how could this happen? How could Donald Trump get elected? Well, what we're seeing in the United States right now is no different than what we are seeing in other parts of the world the rise of right-wing populist parties who pose a threat to peace, to our freedom, and to democracy, and especially a threat to the trade union movement and everything that we stand for. But we should not be surprised. 
The neoliberal approach to globalization in the past three decades has deepened inequality in industrial economies. Non-market economies like China, where workers have no rights. They've been allowed to dump their excess capacity into our markets while social safety nets have weakened. And as I said earlier, in the United States, these policies have caused the loss of hundreds of thousands of good paying industrial jobs in steel, aluminum, tire, paper, glass, and the list goes on and on. And, the and in the United States, unlike here in Sweden, those people have no safety nets. When you lose your job in the United States, you lose your health insurance, you can lose your house, you can even lose your family. So it is really no surprise that workers who, had, who saw themselves with a bleak future, that they actually thought that Trump could do something for them, and they helped him win the election. The question now was how do we, the labor movement, fight back and ensure that we do not allow Mr. Trump and others like him around the world to destroy our unions and our way of life? Well, we certainly don't have the time here today to have that discussion, but we can certainly take heart in what we are hearing, even at this conference this week. How we need to fight back on a global level, as we heard from General Secretary Sanchez from Industrial. I am sure when we hear from your Prime Minister, Stefan Lofen, he will talk about the global deal to create a global mechanism for social dialogue. The message from Sister Nazma on how we must strengthen industry-wide agreements like the Bangladesh Accord by expanding them to include freedom of association and collective bargaining. And the work that we are doing, the United Steelworkers and Unite the Union from the UK, we do a lot of work through Workers Uniting where we foster communication, collaboration, and coordination among our memberships with over 180 common employers that we've identified. These efforts have included proactive relationship building at industry and company levels aimed at increasing our organizing and bargaining power. They have also included joint solidarity efforts in response to employer attacks on our memberships. Global solidarity working together. So the bottom line is really what we are seeing here in the United States, or over there in the United States, it's going to take a global approach from all of us in order to fight back. Because it's not just a US problem anymore. It truly is a global problem. And I thank you for your attention.